Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Durian uh, with Jefferson County, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee, and I call to order the August 22nd, 2022 Dr. Cog TAC meeting. In this digital for meeting format, members and alternatives have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. We ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button uh, to ask questions or comment on an agenda item. Please make sure that you've uh, You've got your name typed so that it reflects your first and last name and your representation. If you have any technical questions, you can direct uh, those to our staff in the Q&A box. So at this time, um, Cam, we will ask you to uh, list attendees. And if for some reason you don't hear your name, please uh, email Cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so you, your name can be added to the record. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in attendance uh, at this moment, I see Steve Durian, I see Brooks Voboda, Brian Weimer, Aaron Busto, uh, David Sabatos, Don Sluter, Deborah Basket, Eugene Howard, Frank Bruno, Hillary Simons, Justin Schmitz, Kent Mormon, Kevin Ash, Mac Callison, Mike Whitaker, Phil Greenwald, Rachel Holtine, Ron Papsdorf, uh, Lisa Nguyen, Jeff Dackenbring, Elizabeth Relford, Bill uh, Soroy, uh, David Gaspers, uh, and Kathleen Brackey. Uh, those are all the members uh, all, and alternates I see at this time, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Cam. Uh, we don't have any new members to introduce today, so we'll move on to our public comment. Uh, we will now open the meeting to public comment. If you can have, if you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button, and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine, and we will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you, and then you will have to, uh, you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which time we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, after public comment period is complete, only TAC members and alternatives will be uh, able to partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. Please raise your hand if you do have any public comment today. Yeah, it looks like we don't have any comment or we don't have any hands raised. So we will then close public comment and uh, move on to the July 25th, 2022 TAC meeting summary. Is there anyone, um, TAC members or alternates who would like to discuss, correct, uh, or ask questions about uh, the TAC meeting summary? Please use your raise hand button to indicate you have a question, correction, or would like to speak. Seeing no raised hands, we will call those meetings uh, meeting minutes approved. Uh, today, we do not have any action items. So we will start with item number four on your agenda, which is informational briefing about Dr. Cog transportation demand management strategies plan kickoff. And I believe Emily Lindsay is our staff person giving this presentation today. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me pull up the presentation and get started. All right, thumbs up. I can see, you can see the slides and hear me. All right, thank you, Deborah. <laughs> I'm Emily Lindsay. I am Dr. Cog's Active and Emerging Mobility Program Manager, and I'm here to chat about the Dr. Cog's Transportation Demand Management or TDM strategic plan. Um, as many of you know, the TDM landscape in the region is, is continuing to grow, and I think effective TDM really requires the use of a bunch of different strategies that really cross different disciplines, maybe departments even. Um, traditionally, we've really emphasized marketing and education and outreach, but we know that there are TDM components that are part of infrastructure, mobility services, parking, um, pricing, land use incentives, all kinds of good stuff. This is certainly not an exhaustive list, um, but I think the idea is that the TDM landscape has really grown a lot. Um, and so for us to kind of consider what TDM means at the regional level, um, we really have to consider a suite of different options. And so 
This TDM strategic plan was identified in Dr. Cog's UPWP. This is really not meant to replace Dr. Cog's existing short range plan, um, which was done in 2012, but really to overhaul that entirely <laughs> to kind of rethink TDM and mobility services in the Denver region. Um, really thinking about Dr. Cog's both internal programs and projects, but also our work with partners throughout the region uh, that are doing great TDM work today and will continue in the future. We've also seen um, kind of a lot of travel changes as a result of the pandemic, uh, new technologies, emerging modes. So we want to certainly kind of reconsider what TDM looks like in today's landscape. And so this process, which I'm just going to kind of give you a quick overview of the process and, and mostly let you know that we're kicking off the process, um, is really meant to help us evaluate some of our existing TDM work, whether that's in our programs, our practices, our, our partnerships, which are certainly a hallmark kind of program of Dr. Cog, and even policy work that we do throughout the region. Uh, we will be engaging a variety of stakeholders and partner agencies, so this is not just Dr. Cog itself, We'll be reaching out to member governments, to TMAs, to TMOs, uh, even members of, of the public. Um, and we have really the goal of identifying different actions that Dr. Cog should take, kind of in the short and medium term, really to support TDM in the region, to support the work that our partners are doing and to help people move um, throughout the region. So as part of that kind of strategic action plan, we also wanted to develop a toolkit that folks can use um, both at the local government partner level, even our regional and state partners. Um, so a toolkit, thinking about all the different suite of TDM strategies um, and how those might relate to different plan goals, civic purposes, um, and, and different elements that we're considering throughout the planning process. And so, like I mentioned, we're just kicking this work off really this month. Um, so getting started on uh, thinking through different engagement strategies. So the stakeholder and public outreach um, plan will be coming out soon, but then we'll be launching really into existing conditions, a needs assessment and evaluation. So like I mentioned, kind of considering what we've done in the past, how that's, how that's worked uh, out in the region, things that we'd like to do in the future, uh, really coming up with that planning framework, those kind of that action plan, um, and additionally, that TDM toolkit. So this is going to be a longer process. Uh, we want to make sure that we have robust engagement of stakeholders throughout the region, just because there are so many folks doing great work in this space. Um, and we want to be sure um, to kind of give time to each of these dedicated tasks. So like I mentioned, kind of early, late summer or early fall, We'll be developing that public and stakeholder engagement plan, really getting that kickoff process started, engaging stakeholders, which will include a stakeholder steering committee and kind of a review of the existing state of TDM in the Denver region, and then moving forward from there. Uh, so this is just our first checkpoint with TAC to let you all know that the process is kicking off. Um, if you or staff from your agency are particularly interested in TDM or definitely wanna make sure you're on one of the contact lists, please reach out and let me know. Um, we'd love to have you and uh, anyone from your agency participate. So my contact info is here and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Emily. Looks like we have a question from Brian Weimer. Yeah, thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, my question is, um, TDM is different throughout the region. We have urbanized areas and rural areas within Dr. Cog. So how are you separating and will you be looking at those different areas in terms of uh, uh, implementation and what that means for those different demographics, if you will? Yeah, absolutely. That is a great comment. I think that's something that we've been uh, even more aware of recently as we kind of considered this broadening TDM <laughs> definition. Um, about how different strategies work in different land use contexts, um, maybe even geographic contexts. Uh, so we're definitely going to be identifying strategies, especially in the TDM toolkit, kind of by applicable community size, uh, land use typology, and different factors like that. Um, uh, there are some strategies, obviously, that are super specific to a land use 
context and we want to be sure to capture kind of that unique decision making that happens um, in across the region because we certainly have a very uh, varied land use context um, and just like socio demographic context. So we will be addressing that um, both in the stakeholder outreach component, making sure we're engaging with folks uh, across the region, uh, but also in that toolkit and list of action strategies as far as like where some of the strategies are most applicable. All Thank right. Uh, next up is Kent, Kent Mormon. Thank you, Emily. Uh, are you planning to do this with Dr. Tug's staff or will you have a consultant on board? This was curious. Um, looks like a big task ahead of you and wish you well. <laughs> I always appreciate well wishes. No, that's a great question. We do have some consultant support. So we'll be working with Urban Trans and they have a subcontractor, Nelson Nygaard, that will also be supporting the project. So um, the budget's not super big. So we'll be doing some tasks in-house and some tasks uh, with consultant support, but overall we're certainly working with Urban Trans and Nelson Nygaard. Thank you. And not seeing any other hands. Uh, so I think we don't, we're, Thank you very much, Emily. We'll move on to our next agenda item. Next up on our agenda is item number five, strengthening mobility and revolutionizing transportation, the SMART grant. Greg McKinnon. Okay, I'm coming. I, I think I got it now. <clears throat> there. Um, good afternoon. Uh, the, as was just read, strengthening mobility and revolutionizing transportation smart grant is one of the items in the uh, uh, bipartisan infrastructure uh, law. And um, so it was, uh, there was a uh, training webinar uh, in July 28th that uh, we attended to uh, get a sense of what was coming up. And so we're giving an overview of that. Um, but you can see the fancy logo coming out of the, the, um, uh, the name SMART. And we have a link there and the link will be at the end of the presentation as well. Uh, but looking to advance the smart city or community technologies and systems to improve efficiency and safety. Uh, something that's uh, very much like the regional transportation operations and the advanced mobility partnership uh, discussions that we've been having as of late. The uh, applicants uh, give the appearance of just about everybody. Uh, we have the state uh, political subdivisions of the state including local, local agencies, tribal governments, uh, public transit agencies, the toll authorities, uh, the MPO, uh, or partnerships of, of the above. The type of projects that uh, it focuses on are uh, coordinated automation, which refers to the automated transportation or autonomous vehicles, uh, connected vehicles, intelligent sense, sensor-based infrastructure uh, that's uh, getting smart uh, devices out in the field to be able to provide uh, a better sense of what's going on and be able to manage it better. Uh, systems integration, commerce delivery and logistics. So they're looking for innovative data and technological solutions uh, to support efficient goods movement. Uh, innovative aviation technology, which is uh, UAS, un unmanned aircraft systems. Smart grid, which is uh, electrical uh, improvements. And smart traffic signals. Uh, and their example that they focus on is the automated traffic signal performance measures. Uh, the reason why they had their training was to get people uh, set for the notice of uh, funding opportunity that will be coming up in September. And uh, the information that's provided on their website is highlighting that the applications will be due November. Um, gen uh, they'll have 100 million available uh, nationwide uh, each year uh, uh, with, but in the, uh, the first, uh, set of projects, which uh, I'll, I'll highlight here, there's a couple stages, this would be a $2 million project cap um, that uh, is expected to be completed over 18 months. And that's uh, not has no uh, non-federal match 
requirement, and uh, they didn't specify any limit to the number of applications that might be uh, submitted. Uh, interestingly, they uh, are earmarking uh, or targeting uh, the, the um, funds to different sized communities. So you can see that for a large community of over 400,000 uh, is, is the, the a, a portion. And then there's mid-sized communities, which is anything less than 400,000, uh, the rural communities, uh, or regional partnerships uh, that, that fall into the third category. So this, these are the stages that I was talking about. The first stage uh, that they're focusing on uh, for this year, uh, but in, in, it will work out in uh, uh, these multiple stages uh, throughout the uh, entire program. The first step or stage is the planning and prototyping. Uh, so it's uh, focusing on something that uh, is uh, on the edge of being widespread, but not quite widespread yet in terms of deployment that are addressing one of the um, the categories that were in the previous slide. Um, and then stage two, uh, having been successful with your stage one project, uh, you would then move on to, uh, if you're selected, move on to a project implementation, which is expanding from the prototype and scaling the project up. And those projects will not begin uh, uh, except they won't accept begin accepting applications for the stage two projects until next year uh, for the notice of funding opportunities. And, and like I said, you, you have to have submitted and completed the stage one before you're eligible to get stage two. Uh, they did highlight some specific ineligible activities, uh, if they're the common in, uh, reimbursement for pre-award pre work or application prep costs, but also traffic parking enforcement and purchase of uh, license plate readers. So from the, the webinar, a few highlights, uh, they really emphasized uh, identifying the problem uh, and then uh, selecting a, a category that, to, to be able to address that problem rather than uh, considering what technology you want to demonstrate and then, um, and then, uh, then try and find a problem to, to deal with it. Um, the, 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 this is a demonstration uh, program. They've uh, they, high, they emphasize that too. So, and that's where it's related to technologies that are mature but haven't been fully uh, uh, wide widely spread uh, in deployment. And so, uh, the 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 downside of that means that it's not meant to be for uh, research or, or testing uh, new technologies out, but uh, being able to move on to deployment after the prototyping. Uh, the, the regular um, federal requirements still apply, uh, as shown on there. And uh, the one thing that uh, they made uh, a big point on is that you must have your uh, unique entity identifier, UA, UEI, um, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with it and familiar with DUNS, uh, they have, uh, uh, the DUN has been replaced with UEI. So if you haven't uh, applied for this number yet, they suggest that you do it right away because it takes about a month to get that number. Um, so that was the uh, uh, quick summary of what the grant opportunity is. Uh, and then because you know, recognizing that there's going to be uh, interest from uh, multiple jurisdictions uh, for multiple projects, uh, felt it would be good to kind of begin the discussion now uh, to see what uh, interest lies in um, being, uh, you know, from different jurisdictions to be applying for uh, some of these grant funds and how potentially it could be coordinated across the region. Um, uh, to highlight here is the, the, the uh, Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Strategic Plan that is uh, about to be released for a, uh, a draft review is highlighting some uh, uh, platforms as, as um, high priority initiatives that are needed to be able to, to conduct regional transportation operations. Thinking that the, from an MPO perspective, this is a, uh, you know, these are our candidates that could be, uh, could be put forward. Um, and then uh, the, the 
the uh, the goal would be to see you know uh, is it possible to uh, coordinate the different projects that are being put forward uh, so that we're not in a position of of uh, competing with each other uh, and you know looking for opportunities to kind of uh, meet the requirements of the um, whoops uh, of the uh, um, the grant application uh, while uh, also maximizing our chances to get a, a grant uh, to the region. So um, I think I'll take a short break there to see if there is something that, uh, that's been brought to mind uh, you know, as I've been talking to see if there is interest uh, from, uh, from the group on what uh, projects might be put forward. Hey, does anyone have any questions? Well, Greg, it doesn't look like we have any questions for you right now. Wait, here we go, Frank Bruno. Yeah, not a question so much, but I, I what Greg had just said about um, you know what types of projects might come forward. If we had any of that information, I'd be really interested. Um, if you didn't want to take the time now, just direct me where I might find that but otherwise I'm I think that's very interesting and thanks for the presentation um all right so you're asking like what what types of projects might be being put forward or yep. Uh, yep. kind of uh, reaching out to our our members and and uh inventorying you know what's what's being planned yeah no you had just said that if we were interested you might be able to give us a sense of what types of projects so I was just curious Oh, okay. Well, and the, the so I was referring to these uh, projects, these ah, project categories, yep. are the types of projects that are, are of interest. And I'll, I'll and I think I, I overlooked uh, mentioning one thing. There, there, one comment in the uh, in the webinar was, "Don't submit a project trying to address each of these. Uh, focus <laughs> on something." Uh, it's 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 uh, probably deserves to be said, but that's uh, that's why I was mentioning. And then, so if uh, we look here, we talk about the situational awareness platform is a a um, a, uh, a web based uh, platform for our operators and planners to be able to see what's going on in the region uh, at any particular time through the different modes and stuff like that. Uh, performance monitoring, very similar, where you could have. Uh, different visualizations and charts and graphs uh, that show uh, how the, uh, the the signal systems uh, across the jurisdictional boundaries are performing, and be able to highlight that the where issues exist, and we can then address them on a real time basis. So those those are uh, you know the, the the steps that that we would detail in an application, saying that that uh, you know we not only are we demonstrating this, but but it has a an actual benefit that. Uh, of what we're doing and um, you know, uh, highlighting that these are, are high priority items that are in the strategic plan that's uh, 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 about to be distributed. Um, and we would like to make sure that the, the applications that we're putting forward are consistent with uh, our regional strategic planning uh, so that they can have full support from the region. Thanks, Greg. No problem. So, oh, okay. Go ahead, Greg. Oh, okay. Uh, I I was presuming that was the only uh, comment. We, we, but... we do have one more hand in the air, and that's Brian Weimer. Okay. Thanks, Greg. And not seeing what's in the strategic plan, my question was or is: um, at one time there was a lot of discussion about system integration across the entire region, and I don't know necessarily that we've gotten there. Uh, with all the different systems that are, are out there. What is the plan maybe with these grants, since I see that's one of the maybe focus areas um, for, is that something that Dr. Cog would pursue to help with system integration and being able to um, talk to one another, let alone gathering the data, but that can be done without that integration. So the question is, where do we stand with that? And is that part of the strategic plan? And would this be an opportunity to fund? Uh, yes, the, um, uh, the, 
the system integration, there's nothing that precludes that. The, the focus uh, and where I highlighted on the performance monitoring platform is you know, using the data to understand how the systems are working so that uh, we can collaborate for uh, uh, managing the system. So the physical integration uh, isn't, uh, isn't the focus, but the uh, integration of the operations uh, based on the data that's being uh, collected is, is what, what we're focusing on. So that, that's uh, a high, one of the pri high priority items in the plan. Okay. I don't see any other hands. So Greg, if you wanna uh, continue with your presentation. Okay, uh, just uh, just giving a heads up that you know, kind of we we began the discussion uh, uh, a little bit here, making you aware, and uh, uh, as you're thinking about it, then we'll be prepared for when the notice does come out that we uh, uh, will uh, host a uh, coordinating workshop that um, is going to be separate of the the, the committees and and board meetings, but to something. Uh, uh, specific to the application process itself. So we have an opportunity to uh, more specifically discuss any ideas uh, and opportunities to uh, coordinate uh, and then uh, you know uh, look at uh, for uh, levels of support uh, from each other for uh, regional scale applications, kind of like uh, Brian Weimer had suggested, uh, but also discuss how how and what uh, projects uh, Dr. Cog might be able to support that are being uh, submitted separately. So more to come on that. And I think this is the second time that we have the URL there. Uh, it's in the, the packet, so you should be able to go see that, that that website will be updated with their most current information and a copy of the, uh, the, the webinar uh, is on there. Recording of the webinar is, is on there as well. And there's my contact information. If something comes up that you're uncertain about, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, I see Walter Wirt, you've got your hand in the air. I do, Greg, I came out of the private sector as a logistics and truck transportation person. And I noticed on one of your slides, there was some discussion. Was there any thoughts or guidance offered because you're gonna to have to get the private sector involved. And that's a, another issue. And I'm just curious as to what, if anything came out of that uh, startup meeting. Um. The, I'm not sure what meeting you're referring to. I think we will be having uh, a meeting when the notice comes out. And, and I agree with you that that's kind of an odd balance that will need to be struck. Uh, you know, uh, federal funding uh, has specific rules about, you know, how do we uh, work on uh, the, the, the private side of things. And, you know, these, these are grants to the public side of things. So that is something that, that would, uh, you know, require some coordination, there's no doubt. But uh, to, uh, in, in terms of the logistics side, I am not aware of any um, uh, uh, planning uh, you know, uh, related to these grants uh, to date. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to our next item. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you. Okay, uh, next item on our agenda is the equity analysis project update. Uh, Alvan Vidal Sanchez, I believe you're up. Thank you, Chair. Give me a second to pull everything up. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alan Vidal Sanchez. I'm a planner here at Dr. Cog in the Transportation Planning and Operations Division. And my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm also presenting with a colleague and I'll let them introduce themselves as well. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Byron Schultz. I'm a GIS specialist here at Dr. Cog and my pronouns are he, him, his. I look forward to uh, presenting this information to you today. So our item today focuses on uh, specifically our environmental justice work that we do as Dr. Cog, but we do want to provide a refresher to our various equity requirements that Dr. Cog adheres to, some of the various plans and programs that we've done in the past and how they've used 
equity analysis and the environmental justice analysis. So we'll also talk through a project that staff have been involved in for the last couple months. And then I'll pass it over to Byron to give an overview of some different methods we're looking at to set a threshold for our environmental justice work. Uh, he'll provide a demonstration of a web map that's been developed. It's also been included in the presentation and the meeting packet. And then we'll also provide opportunity for any questions, comments, um, and any discussion you'll have as we go through this. A quick refresher for those who are here and recall the uh, non-discrimination plans that we adopted last year. But uh, these are the highlights of the major statutes that Dr. Cog adheres to related to non-discrimination. Um, Y'all probably heard of many of these, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, discri forbidding discrimination against anyone based on race, color, or national origin, Executive Order 12898, also known as the Environmental Justice Executive Order, so making sure that agencies identify and address impacts on people of color and people with low income. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, prohibiting discrimination against people with disabilities in all areas of public life. Executive Order 13166, also known as the Limited English Proficiency Executive Order, so making sure that Dr. Cog as an agency is providing meaningful access to its programs, activities, services for people with limited English proficiency. The Older Americans Act of 1965 is a little more specific to our area agency on aging side of the shop by making sure that people with the greatest economic or social need, particularly low income and minority individuals, older people with limited English proficiency and older adults in living area in rural areas are getting the services that they need. And then a new piece that you might not have heard of that we won't talk too much on in this presentation, but giving you a heads up uh, through Colorado Senate Bill 21260, there is a new state requirement related to disproportionately impacted communities and analysis done for those. And they are specifically people of color, people with low income and housing cost burden households. Today's item specifically focused on one piece of those, which is environmental justice and how Dr. Cog has historically approached this and some alternatives we're gonna be presenting to you today. Uh, again, the executive order specifically only looks at two communities. So minority and low income, I'll be referring to them as communities of color and low income communities. Uh, it helps reinforce requirements from Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. There's no prescribed methodology from, uh, from guidance issued by the feds for setting those thresholds. So that's up to us as an agency, what we feel is most appropriate for us. And then all agencies receiving federal funds have to comply with this executive order. When it comes to our transportation plans and programs, we have to make sure as an agency that we're providing a fully inclusive public outreach program and that in communities of color and low-income communities are not being disproportionately impacted, but are also reaping the benefits of projects and programs that are being invested in the region. Now we've done analysis around environmental justice communities that low-income and communities of color uh, historically by um, shading in areas of the region that we call environmental justice zones. So on your screen, the screenshot on your left is pulled from the 2022 to 2025 transportation improvement program. And in it, various transportation analysis zones are shaded. And those are transportation analysis zones where the percent of individuals of color are at or above the regional average, or the percent population poverty are at or above the regional average. So that's a quick yes, no, is this transportation analysis zone above the regional average. And then we typically just do a quick overlay analysis. In this case, the screenshot on your left is showing roadway projects and how those compare to the various environmental justice zones in the region. When we use these regional thresholds, what results is about 40% of all of the transportation analysis zones actually get designated as an EJ zone. And about half of the region's population actually lives in an EJ zone in that case. Uh, through the project that I'll be introducing, we're looking at improving that definition, recognizing that 40% of all TAZs and 50% of the region's population being designated in an EJ area might be uh, too high or we're shading too much of the region, capturing too much of the region. So potentially identifying fewer zones with greater concentrations. Right now, there's no way to distinguish whether a EJ zone is 34% people of color versus 66% people of color, knowing that the regional average is 33%, both which is be considered an EJ zone. There's also different threshold concentrations. So the regional average for people of color is different than the regional average for household with low income. So seeing those various numbers, those different regional averages, uh, you might get the impression that these are arbitrary and why aren't we being more consistent in that methodology? And then one piece that we've always kept in the back of our minds and we've heard throughout uh, our planning process and previous feedback is that uh, marginalized communities 
uh, and individuals who uh, we've identified within those characteristics or variables do exist outside of these designated EJ zones. And so we could be missing pockets of those communities or uh, just missing how people um, move in the region based on, based on those characteristics. I'm going to highlight three uh, most recent plans and programs that Dr. Cox has done in the last year, year and a half. Uh, it's our Title VI Implementation Plan, which was last September, our Regional Transportation Plan, which we adopted last April, and then the 2022 to 2025 Transportation Improvement Program we adopted last April as well. For each of these, there was a uh, spatial analysis, an overlay analysis of projects. Uh, moving left to right, when we look at our Title VI Plan, we were looking at census tracts. So again, keeping that same methodology of identifying geographic areas that are above a regional average. In that case, census tracts are highlighted in teal that are above the 33% average for people of color. And then we did a overlay of TIP projects on that just to see how the investment compares across the region. Uh, in the middle is the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. In that case, we used transportation analysis zones, but it's still the, the, same, the same steps. So shading those areas, whether they are an EJ zone, and then overlaying the various projects that have been evaluated, so evaluated and included in the plan over them to see how they compare across the region. And then the TIP took that analysis as well and then broke it down by project type. So same transportation analysis zones, but then showing how the various projects, uh, transit, roadway, a bike ped, flesh out through the region based on whether an area is environmental justice zone or not. So recognizing that we had some of those uh, concerns, constraints with the existing analysis of identifying environmental justice zones, uh, Dr. Cog's staff have been involved in a project for the last couple months, trying to improve our equity analysis more broadly, not just related to environmental justice, but that's our topic of discussion today, but making uh, some objectives for this project include making our equity analysis more meaningful, we want to continue to evolve our stakeholder and public engagement. So a piece of this is trying to figure out how we reach out to more people across the region uh, and in include them in our process uh, in more places. We've also been looking at a way to use an equity analysis for future funding and investment decisions. And we'd like to uh, make sure that our equity approaches are applicable to other Dr. Cog planning processes and products. As you all know, we wear a number of different hats in the region. So if we can be consistent, in our definitions, in the analysis we're using, that'll uh, help, help us throughout our agency. I mentioned we're a couple months into this project. Um, it began with a research into what other MPOs across the nation are doing. So how are they mapping these communities? What communities are they including? How are they defining them? Uh, and so through that, we came up with some recommendations to improve our methods. We're now here looking at uh, how we define environmental justice zones. So we're coming before y'all to get y'all's input on the different alternatives that have come up, as well as one of an initial products that we've developed that Byron will go over, which is our marginalized communities data set. Um, this is a multi-phase project. We expect to continue into the next year. So we are looking at piloting an equity index. I'm looking at what a benefit or burden could be for a project. Uh, we do still need to have a environmental justice report for the adopted TIP next August. And then when we do our next regional transportation plan, we'll build in some of these improvements in that equity analysis work as well. And throughout the project, we've uh, engaged various stakeholders in the region. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Byron to give a breakdown on one of the initial products and take over the EJ conversation. Thank you, Alvin. Um, great, so as Alvin mentioned, we are in a phase of the project where we're um, diving into the data more and we are looking at revising certain data sets um, that have to do with equity. And we want to make sure that we're doing that in a way that these data sets are meaningfully showing where people, um, populations of interest live. And so to date, what we have done um, to do that is produce this vulnerable populations data set, which is shown here. And this is based on census, American community survey data for the different subpopulations that are shown in those blue boxes below. Um, and so included, included a, a decent range there but if Alvin, you want to advance one slide, um, we are revising that vulnerable populations data set and we are calling it now um, marginalized communities data set is a preferred terminology. And there are going to be some changes to um, the different characteristics and subpopulations we are tracking. And so here you can see that many of them are um, the same from, from the old data set to the new data set. 
there are some definition changes. One of the notable ones up top is instead of households with low income, we will be um, using people with low income. And the reason for that is, is that tracking people with low income is much more accurate than households. And it also allows us to look at people who are um, above the poverty threshold, maybe 150% uh, above the poverty threshold or 200% above the poverty threshold. And that allows us some flexibility that you don't have with the household level data. Uh, another one that is changing, um, older adults, we're just expanding that to older adults 60 and over um, to align more with programs that happen in the AAA side of, um, of Dr. Cog, as well as the Older Americans Act. And then children and youth under 18, we are, we're going to, um, we're, we're instead of doing children and youth five to 17, we're including all youth under 18, um, because no matter what age those children are, uh, their parents may have certain uh, unique transportation needs, financial stressors and time stressors. So we felt that was appropriate. And then we are adding three, uh, three new variables at the bottom there. So housing cost burden households, and this goes back to what Alvin was saying about the new um, Colorado Senate bill, which talks about disproportionately impacted communities, housing cost burden households being one component of that. Um, people born outside the US, um, part of Title VI prohibits discrimination against, against people due to their national origin. We felt that was appropriate to include. And then single parent households as well, again, um, kind of getting at the idea that, that these are households that may have be time stressed, uh, financially stressed, and have uh, unique transportation needs based on the members of that household. And um, we are gonna produce this at the tract level instead of block group and tract. And that is essentially for um, data reliability purposes. And so if you wanna advance one, Alvin. Um, and finally, the, the data set that's really the, the main topic of this update for you all is the, the revision to the environmental justice data set. And so Alvin explained how that's been defined in the past and that it uses those two, uh, those two variables. And so in the past, it has used, um, for Dr. Cog anyway, as we've defined it, has used households with low income. And we're going to change that to people with low income for the, the reasons I previously stated. And then people of color, of course, that's going to remain the same. And those are the only two variables that in, that, um, in that definition. So, um, so given that, uh, if you want to advance one slide, Alvin, um, we are not only looking at revising and improving the definition to the environmental justice data set itself, but we also want to um, improve the way that we are defining it on the map. Um, and so as Alvin mentioned, all those limitations about how much of the region has been designated, I want to present to you now some alternatives for ways in which we can designate environmental justice zones. And so the first, uh, the first alternative I'll present here is the standard deviation approach. And so this is uh, at its basic level, a measure of how far each estimate is from the regional average. And so below here in this screenshot is an example of how this works. So if you have two block groups here, one in orange and one below it in blue, um, if, you have, if you look at the data for the orange block group, the estimate is that there's 31.7% people with low income in that location. Uh, the regional average is 21.4% across all block groups across the entire region. And that equates to a 0.6 standard deviation above the mean for that estimate. So it gives you, it gives you a one, a single number measure of how far away that estimate is. For the block group below it, um, on the other hand, there is an estimate that there's 55.8% of people with low income there. And again, the regional average is that 21.4%. And so this equates to a higher 1.9 standard deviation above the mean. Um, and so this gives you a way to compare across, across our different geographies, how high those estimates are and if they are significant concentration. And so the way we kind of um, can move forward with this is we can say any block group where the standard deviation 4% of people with low income is greater than one, we'll designate that as an environmental justice zone. Um, so in this case, the blue block group would be designated and the orange one would not. You can advance the next one, Elvin. The second approach um, is the quartile or quintile approach. And so this is simply the idea of separating data into four uh, or five groups of equal size based on the percentile. And so in this example, you can see this data set um, in, this, in this diagram with eight numbers. And so basically the idea is that you take those eight numbers 
and you put two numbers into each into each bin, into each quartile. Um, and so the first quartile would contain the lowest two numbers. Um, and then the fourth quartile would contain the highest two numbers. And this is equivalent to saying that's the 75th percentile. And so similarly, we could set a threshold here where um, the percent people of color, or percent people of low income needs to be in the fourth quartile for it to be designated environmental justice zone. So that's how this method works. So if you want to advance one, um, this next slide, now that we've, I know that's kind of some math. I really enjoy the math, but kept it simple. This next slide here, um, now that we've got those kind of methods established, just shows how they compare when you apply them to the actual, the actual data and the actual estimates in our region. So this graph shows the distribution of percent of people with low income values for all block groups in the region. So on the horizontal x-axis, you have ranges of values for that percent of people with low income. And then the y-axis shows you the number of block groups that fall into each of those ranges. And so for example, um, the most block groups in our region fall in the range of five to 10% um, percent people with low, with low income. And so um, up until now, using the regional average, you can see that horizontal orange line there that shows, that shows us that everything to the right of that line um, is going to be designated as an EJ zone because that's where the re regional average sits in that distribution. The fourth quartile approach would be more selective than that. And so you can see how that's moving farther to the right. It's around 31% um, would, would be the cutoff for that. And then the one standard deviation above the average is um, even more selective than the quartile approach. And so this just gives you an idea of how these kind of play out, um, trying to address that idea of you know, using the regional average is designating too many zones, too much of the area. These other two approaches are more selective and, and seem to be an improvement to us. So yes, yeah, so you please advance one. So the next um, thing I'll show here, and I'll, I'll switch over to my screen. Um, Let's see here once Alvin's done, but the this map I'm going to sh show you is available to you as well to the packet. You just saw the link to it in the um, into the in the presentation. Let's see here. Alvin, can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay. So this I just want to demonstrate to you all so you can you can see it and you can take the time to look into it yourself. But this is how these different alternatives actually play out in the region and how they look. So um, first of all, you do have some base layers here to show you different boundaries in terms of the MPO boundary, uh, the Council of Governments boundary, different counties. And we just added uh, today municipalities layer. So if you want to um, look at how these EJ zones look in your own municipality, you can do that. And so my computer's a little slow right now. Um, but digging into, into the data and the way we're defining these zones. So to set a baseline, this first layer I'm showing you here in green is, is what, um, what we have done at this point. It's using, it's using the a criteria that either EJ variable is above the regional average and that's, and that's it. So this is what it would look like if we applied that criteria at the block group level, you can see that is in the past, a lot of the region is, is shaded in. Um, and so that's just to give you a baseline. However, if you look at it, it looks like when you do either variables in the top quartile, that's shown here in blue. So you can see if you toggle off and on the other layer, this, this regional average layer, you can see how it's being more selective in what zones are being designated. And so this gives you a kind of a quick comparison. One step further is that one standard deviation approach, and that's this top layer. And this is what it looks like in the region when you use the criteria that either EJ variable needs to be one standard deviation above uh, the regional average, at least. And so you can see compared to the quartile approach, we are again um, being a little more selective with the zones that are designated. And a lot more selective than we would be if we were using the, um, the regional average. Those colors don't blend terribly well, but but this gives you an idea of how these how these three alternatives compare when you look at it visually. Um, and so again, we encourage you to 
take the time to look at this yourself so you have more time to really zoom into your areas of interest and, and to, to provide input to us. Um, and this takes me to the to the last last slide. So I think I will I will stop sharing there and Alvin has his presentation again. We just have to close out a couple slides here. Great. So all this is to say this is the, the first time that we're coming to you with this with this topic and we intend for this to be the start of an ongoing conversation with you all to hear your feedback on all these different alternatives. And so the, one of the next steps as part of that is to um, receive your feedback both here in real time, but also through comments that you can provide to us after this meeting as you explore the map. Um, we will continue to explore mapping techniques. We, we will continue to explore particularly the one standard deviation approach as a, a strong candidate that really helps resolve some of the issues with the, with the prior environmental justice zones. And then pilot the equity index benefits burdens analysis, which Alvin mentioned before in our project timeline. So I think the last slide here will show um, our contact information for both Alvin and I. So again, we encourage you to take the time to look at the map. If you don't have the ability to comment now, you can later. Um, if you could give us comments within the next week about this kind of initial, initial um, display of these different alternatives, that would be wonderful. But we will leave it open for questions now. So that is the conclusion of our presentation. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we've got a question from Phil Greenwald. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, this presentation. This is great. Um, I guess I would be the first to admit that uh, I'm kind of an old, old dog trying to learn new tricks here. But uh, so the change from household to person is interesting to me, and I don't really understand it, especially when you expand the, the, the people that you're looking at basically from infants uh, older, right? So you, you talked about you're not going to look at, it's going to be all children and youth now, not from five to 17. So how do you, how do you classify then an infant or even a five-year-old, four-year-old as far as income? I mean, I don't, that's the part that's kind of throwing me a little bit. And I don't think I understood it fully. So thanks for any further explanation you can provide. Yes, Phil, that's a great question. Um, and the way that, so we've looked into this a lot because there's a lot of nuance with the census data. And so I'm happy to follow up with you further after this as well. But um, our understanding is that it's your household size, which can dictate whether that household is in poverty. So if you are um, a married couple and you have three kids and two of those kids happen to be, you know, one year old or two year old kids, you have a household size of five and you have three kids, both of which are factors in where the government sets the poverty level. So what income do you need to be making as a couple for a household of five to not be considered in poverty? That's different than if you were just a married couple with no children. And so it's true that the data will count those, those toddlers or those infants as people in poverty in that household. All five people would be included in that. So you would get a count of five for that household and then another household that has the same income, but just is, it is just one person because they have a smaller household. They don't, they don't qualify as being in poverty. And so they would be, they would count as zero. So the, the data does take into account factors in the household, but then everybody in the household gets classified as, as, as in poverty or not. So does that help kind of answer? Yeah, your that, helps, that helps a lot. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. So we will move on to the next item. Thank you, Byron and Alvin. Next item on our agenda is uh, item number seven, US 287 uh, Bus Rapid Transit Feasibility Study. Jacob, I think you're taking this one. Yeah, thank you. I have the easiest job. I'm just gonna make some introductions, but wanted to bring this to you. Um, Boulder County has been leading a coalition um, doing a bus rapid transit feasibility study on the 287 corridor. Um, so they wanted to present the draft results of that study to all of you. Um, don't want to steal their thunder. So I'm going to start with Kathleen Bracking to introduce this. Kathleen.
Great. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. And I, I'm not sure if it's on your screen, but on mine, there's some bars on the slides, but maybe those will go away <laughs> as we go. I just flipped over. All right. Well, thank you uh, so much for the opportunity to be here today uh, with the Dr. Cog Tech. I'm Kathleen Brackey. I'm the Deputy Director for Boulder County's Community Planning and Permitting Department and lead our transportation planning team. Uh, joining me today is Jeff Butts, our transportation planner and the project manager for the US 287 uh, corridor uh, planning process. And we wanted just to provide a brief overview for all of you about the US 287 corridor planning to date, share some of our initial um, findings around the uh, bus rapid transit feasibility study, and then also describe some of the next steps in the process. Um, but before I hand it off to Jeff, I just want to really emphasize that the cornerstone of this um, planning process for US 287 is really a multi-agency, multi-jurisdictional um, effort, and we really appreciate all the participation uh, by our um, communities, including the City of Longmont, City of Lafayette and Erie, and also City and County of Broomfield, and then RTD and CDOT as well, and Commuting Solutions. Um, in addition, um, and I think I meant, mentioned Lafayette, don't wanna leave anyone out. <laughs> anyway, all of the communities along the corridor. Um, in addition, as we were developing the um, analysis and alternatives around bus rapid transit, we really started to identify that there's an inter-regional travel shed along US 287. So it doesn't just stop and start at the uh, Boulder County line. And so in addition to working with um, city and county of Broomfield, uh, we're also working with uh, Larimer County communities, including Berthet and Loveland and Fort Collins. So really looking at the travel um, demand for transit all the way from Fort Collins um, along 287 and connecting it to Denver. Um, and I think it's important when we talk about the corridor, why, um, as many of you uh, work on in your communities across the region, um, it's really the growing traffic congestion, our goals around safety, our goals around providing affordable and sustainable travel choices for people and helping um, transportation uh, contribute to cleaner air and reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And we also know there's a tremendous amount of growth that's happening along the 287 corridor. And we want to be able to serve that, again, by providing sustainable options and choices for people. So um, with that quick um, intro, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Jeff Butts to provide more information for you on our specific uh, BRT feasibility study. Thank you.
Hey, does anyone have any questions? Pretty quiet group today. I know, oh, Deborah Basket, you got a question. Next up, Frank Bruno. Thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate your presentation. Uh, I, I kind of been on this question for a while now. It's on the Vision Zero campaign or, or project or program, however we kind of designate it. Is, is the enforcement or the enticement uh, for people to I don't know whether I want to say respect or um, follow this. Obviously, we can just focus purely on local municipalities enforcing traffic um, laws and things like that. But is there a broader philosophy on, on how we are going to ultimately get more compliance with Vision Zero? I was really excited when I saw the signage go up when it did you know, some time ago. But I don't know that data shows, and, and I'm ignorant about it, so I don't know if we have data that shows people are um, behaviors have changed or what, or is it really still just related to pure enforcement? Um, any any thoughts on that, or can you point me in a direction where I might learn more? I'm I am pretty fascinated and I'm pretty concerned by the speeds that I I think we all see. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, a great um, answer, Jeff, and, and a really important question, Frank. Thanks for asking that. That's why this phase two work is so critical is because we do know, unfortunately, the data is showing this the crashes are moving in the wrong direction, increasing rather than decreasing. And so looking, as Jeff said, at the whole toolbox of solutions and uh, additional part of the work over and above the county portion for this is actually will be co-funded by CDOT to look at some early action items for some particular um, high crash locations where there have been several fatal crashes um, over the, the past year. So uh, wanting to make sure that we're doing the full study, but uh, in the areas we, where we already know there are high crashes, what are some of the things that could be done uh, sooner rather than later to address that? And then again, complementing that with enforcement and, and more awareness 
and more information to help people slow down and be safer in all weather conditions. And uh, it's it's a challenge. And this is such a critical corridor that the numbers are just frightening. And again, like they are in many of the other corridors around the region. And so we need to find solutions. So we want to do this full comprehensive study, but add on to it some uh, nearer term action items working with CDOT. Thank you both. I appreciate that. Any other questions for Kathleen or Jeff? Not seeing any other questions. So thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Jeff, for a great presentation. Great. Thank you. And if others have suggestions, if you've worked on similar corridor studies in your communities and you have lessons learned or suggestions for us as we're continuing our work on 287, we'd love to hear your thoughts and advice for us. Um, we just appreciate it. We realize this is similar to some of the other studies going on around the metro area and it'd be great to um, learn from you all as well. So thank you. Oh, yeah. All right. Go ahead. Okay, Art, do you have anything more? I think you're muted, Art. Okay, our next item, I don't believe we have a presentation for this item, but uh, the item number eight in your agenda is Federal Transportation Grants Update. Emily, do you wanna uh, talk a little bit about this? Thank you, Emily. All right, so uh, we've, do we have anything for an AMP working group update today?
All right, thank you. Does any other member have uh, any updates for the group? Please raise your hand. Uh, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Jacob, would you like to uh, give us any updates? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to kind of tag on to Ron's comments. Um, Eagle-eyed folks may have noticed that for the first time in about eight months, we do not have a formal 2050 Regional Transportation Plan greenhouse gas update on the agenda today. Um, we wanted to give you all one month break because that's definitely what we'll be discussing at the September 19th meeting. We will be looking for um, an adoption recommendation but right now we are in the middle of our 30 day public comment period. So I did want to encourage all of you, if you haven't already to check out our social pinpoint engagement site for uh, the proposed updated 2050 regional transportation plan. Um, the link is on the front page of our um, of the Dr. Cog website um, to social pinpoint. We have a lot of great information, the plan documents to review. Uh, we also have a series of virtual open houses uh, we're two of five down already. Um, our third one is this week, uh, this Wednesday at 1 p.m. Um, these are all virtual on Zoom, so we would encourage you to attend if you are interested. Um, any one of the five, they're all the same. We're just rotating them uh, by time of day and days of the week so that folks can participate. Uh, we also have ways to provide comment directly on the Social Pinpoint site. Uh, we encourage that as well, um, both your direct review and comment and um, helping us spread the word if you would. Um, and then our public hearing, our public comment period, I should say, is through the end of the day on September 6th. And then our public hearing will be on September 7th on what would normally be our September board work session. We are repurposing it as a special Dr. Cog board meeting. It will be virtual. It will start at 4 p.m. Um, but that will be the time that we will have the public hearing um, on, the, on the proposed 2050 regional transportation plan. So just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob. Any other comments for members? Okay, as Rod mentioned, we will have our next meeting on September 19th, 2022, and uh, likely be live and in person at the Dr. Cog offices. Uh, I'm just seeing, uh, there's a note on our chat here. Uh, there are two new Dr. Cog TPO staff, Nora Kern and Kaylee Fallon, so welcome. Thank you for that update, Emily. Uh, and with that, uh, we are adjourned. So have a great uh, few weeks here until we see each other again on the 19th. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.